Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining the first of Ascend's new speaker series it's called Raising the Bar. We really appreciate everybody for joining. We're really excited for this seminar series. Um, we have a, a number of really exciting speakers lined up uh, to talk about a wide range of topics. And, uh, you know, I think it can be a real advantage, not just for your, you know, fundraising programs potentially, but for, you know, your entire business across your foundation and across your charitable uh, needs. So we're really excited for this series and really excited for our first speaker. We got Greg Baer here today. Um, Greg is the executive director at the Gable Foundation uh, since 2006 um, and has done a ton of really exciting uh, work. And uh, we're really excited to kind of hear everything he has to say. Uh, today, we're talking about the future of learning systems and how sports foundations can act as influencers to remake the learning process. So really excited to get going with Greg here. We're going to start with a good seminar portion here. We have a chat on the side. If you have any questions that come up that you'd like you know, to be noted during the session, um, I can notify Greg and we can go through that question. If not, we will have a Q&A session at the end uh, where we can go over everything. Greg is going to try and keep this tight. Um, and concise. We know, you know, we've got a lot of important people on the call and you're all busy. So we're going to try and keep this as, as tight as possible, but want to make sure you have the time to ask questions. So uh, without further ado, here's Greg. Really looking forward to hearing everything he has to say. Michael, I'm so grateful to you, to Dave, to your teammates to be here. I, I could go for hours because this is something that's fun to talk about. I will endeavor to be concise and you will give me the yank if we need to do that. And your screen's about to go crazy. I promise you in two seconds, it'll be just fine. So um, hello, everyone. It's a genuine honor to be here with you. As Michael said, I'm Greg Bear. I'm the executive director of the Grable Foundation. I've been in the philanthropic giving space for nearly two decades now. I'm also founder and director of something called Remake Learning. We'll come back to that later. And co-author of this book entitled, When You Wonder You're Learning, Mr. Rogers, Enduring Lessons for Raising Creative, Curious, Caring Kids. And this is a little bit how I feel today because I know who you are, what you do, and how meaningful your work is, which is why I also feel like this, because I know the joy and the impact that you have in your communities around a range of issues, including education and learning. I know that you are leaders, you're partners, you're catalysts forging so much which is why this time today is so valuable with you. So thank you for being here. And if you're anything like me, you have all sorts of questions about this moment in which we find ourselves. You know, as we look ahead, there are preferred futures into which we want to walk and prepare ourselves. And there are things that will inevitably happen to us over which we have no control. But on our own and ideally together, we can get to those preferred futures that we want for our own communities that we're privileged to serve and certainly for our country. And surprise, surprise, as we think, particularly in the education and learning space, as we think to that future, we can look to the past and this emotional connection that probably so many of you share with me, with this guy, Mr. Rogers. Now, of course, we think of him as that grandfatherly loving figure that maybe we are privileged to watch his iconic television program, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, alongside a sibling, maybe with a neighbor, with mom or dad. But think about Fred Rogers slightly differently, because Fred was way more than a nice guy in a cardigan. In fact, Fred was, in many ways, a learning scientist who was decades ahead of his time. You see, we can think about Fred Rogers also as an innovator, as a geek, who saw the, the technology of his day, television, saw how that technology was attractive to young people and said, how do I make it good and constructive? So one, he noticed that. But two, the really interesting part of Fred's story is that as he prepared himself for that work as host for Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, he ended up studying at a place called Arsenal Children's Center, where he studied alongside all sorts of scientists, Benjamin Spock, Eric Erickson, Margaret McFarland, and he learned science of his day. It was sort of a Mount Rushmore of learning scientists with whom he was thinking. And he made that learning science come forward in puppetry and lyrics and a physical set itself, even his wardrobe, right? Now, we didn't use the term learning sciences during his day. We didn't talk about whole child during his day. 
But when we understand the academic, cognitive, emotional growth of every child, we understand what these words mean. We understand what we're learning about learning itself. And so oftentimes today, certainly here in Pittsburgh, from which uh, Mr. Rogers aired his iconic television program for more than 40 years, we talk about the Fred method, combining whole child, again, that academic, social, emotional growth that every child needs and deserves, together with everything that we're learning about learning itself. Whole child plus learning sciences equals the Fred method. And in fact, as we can look back at the work that Fred did, he left us some blueprints that are incredibly relevant here in 2023 and beyond. And in fact, that's the work that my co-author Ryan and I write in this book, emotionally connecting us to what Fred Rogers did with the learning science of our day coming out of Carnegie Mellon University here in Pittsburgh or MIT or Stanford University, and then demonstrating examples in schools, museums, and libraries where educators in and out of school, early childhood through higher education are using that Fred method. In fact, we talk about these as Fred's tools for learning. And there are six chapters in our book. And we really dig into what it means to promote curiosity and creativity and collaboration. What it means to create environments where kids know that it's okay to wonder and to wonder aloud in important ways for them. Where we help kids indulge in their creativity and what we as grown-ups need to do to support that where we find ways to connect the things that are familiar in kids' lives to the mystery of what's possible. So many of you probably remember that iconic episode where we go to see the crayon factory and see how crayons are made. The really interesting thing about that episode, if you go back and watch it, is that Fred starts that episode with an easel in his living room and with a crayon, right? He doesn't take us immediately to the factory to see how crayons are made. He starts with the simplicity of a piece of paper and a crayon, something that's so familiar to kids, and then ultimately takes us off to that place of mystery. Ryan and I endeavor to unpack all of these tools for learning. And in the short time that we have today, I just want to share one example of this in a chapter uh, that's really ultimately about connection. Because those of you who watch Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, or maybe you're watching Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood now, the modern animated version of that television show, you know that at the core of every single episode was this sensibility that I like you just the way you are. Now, there are all sorts of interesting studies from the learning sciences that now drive home the, the critical nature of this sensibility. And I want to share just one with you. And if you are in a room together, if we're in a room together, um, I'd put you into three different groups. But here's how this learning science study worked. Some researchers took some college level students and gave them a fake personality test and then divided these college students into three different groups based on that fake personality test. And they said, group number one, based on the results of your study, you're going to have rich, rewarding relationships throughout your life, your marriage, your partnership, your friendships, they're going to flourish. Okay, group number two, it's, it's not quite as rosy as it is for group number one. You're going to have relationships, you're going to have a marriage, you're going to have a partnership, you're going to have friendships, but they might fray and they might you might struggle a bit. And, you know, maybe that's normal. That happens from decade to decade in life and, and friendships come and friendships go. And then they tell a third group, oh my goodness, we're not sure why this is the case, but you're, you're for it. You're going to have accidents. You're going to have injury. You're going to be falling downstairs, hospitalization. It's, it's going to be a hard and harmful life for you. I hope you have good health insurance. Good luck. And then these researchers gave all of these students an IQ test. And think to yourself, which of these groups bombed this test? Was, that, was it the first group, that second group, or that third group? Now, typically in a room together, everyone thinks, of course, it's group number three, right? Because I just told you terrible bad news. And it makes sense that it would be group number three. But in fact, group number three did just as well as group number one. It was group number two. And why was it group number two? It was because I told that group that your relationships were going to fray. And see, in that moment when those students heard that, they lost the ability to reason. They lost the ability to think. They lost the ability to do the things that they would otherwise normally do. Because on any other day, they would have done just as fine as groups number one and as groups number three. Now, fortunately, these researchers told them afterwards, like, look, this was all a ruse. This was a fake personality test. This is not your destiny. 
But this study from the learning sciences, which comes from this century, drives home the radical nature of Mr. Rogers' work. And that is whether we're a preschooler or a retired person, we human beings need to know that we're worth being proud of. That sense of belonging is as critical in kids' lives as is food and water. And in fact, we now have the, the, the neuro mapping uh, of brains to demonstrate that the pain that someone feels when they feel like they don't belong or that they don't matter, it actually affects the same part of the brain as if you fall down the stairs and injure yourselves. Now think about the kids whose programs you benefit, right? Maybe sometimes they're just untethered for a day, but maybe it's for months or maybe it's for years. Absent that sense of longing, of loving and belonging, there's no great learning that can happen. And that's why this is so critically important because ultimately, as we think about educational supports for the kids in our communities, we need to appreciate that learning and love are intimately linked. Now, when you take all of Fred's tools for learning, including connection, but also curiosity and creativity, it all ultimately adds up to an atmosphere. In fact, a journalist one time said, hey, Mr. Rogers, what is it that you're doing with this television program? And he said, I'm creating an atmosphere for learning, right? None of us remember learning fractions or, or learning how to put together sentences during the course of that program. He created a, a great atmosphere for learning that was grounded in wonder and joy and creativity and love, which then confronts us with the question in 2023. And as we look to 24 and beyond, how might we, how might we today employ the Fred method in the places where we lead and serve? How might we bring that sense of the neighborhood and all of the places where kids learn in and out of school, early childhood through higher education? How do we think about our support across the landscape of learning, across the neighborhood, in regions, urban, rural, suburban, and everything in between? And that's something that we've been endeavoring to do right here in Fred Rogers' hometown of Pittsburgh, a photo of which you see in the upper right. We like to think of it as Kidsburg, a great place to raise kids and a place made easier for the adults in their lives to raise kids. And so we're always asking ourselves, how do we apply the Fred method? And we've done that through this incredible network that we call Remake Learning. Because as we think about education, we need to think about learning. Learning, edu whereas education conveys a sense of schooling, learning conveys that bigger sense of what happens out of school and what happens in school, what's happening at home, what's happening in all the places where kids learn. And so today, Remake Learning is a network that we like to say ignites engaging, relevant and equitable learning and support um, for kids whom we know are navigating these times of rapid social and technological change. Engaging, relevant, and equitable. And this is a network that involves thousands of educators in and out of school, librarians, artists, scientists, school administrators. It's this incredible network of people who've come together as a region. So imagine ha this happening in New York City. Imagine it happening in New Orleans. Imagine it happening right here in Pittsburgh, in, in Fred Rogers' hometown. All of these different educators who have a role in kids' lives coming together to say, what is it that we want for our young people in our region? What are the knowledge, the skills, the dispositions that we want to nurture in their lives in all of the places where kids might learn? We know from the learning sciences who today's kids are and how they're fundamentally different than what you and I experienced. And again, we know from the neural mapping of their brains that they're developing their identities differently, seeking affirmation differently, consuming and producing information differently. So how is it that we're going to remake learning experiences? And that's what we've been doing right here in Fred Rogers' hometown, applying the Fred method over the past 15 years remaking a different story about a learning ecosystem, a learning landscape that's ever better connected and that the adults across that ecosystem, teachers and librarians and museum and exhibit designers and youth workers and others are connected in some profoundly important ways such that they are better positioned to advance the types of educational experiences that our kids want, need and deserve. Think of STEM and STEAM and maker-centered learning and technology-enhanced uh, learning and all of the ways that we support powerful, wondrous opportunities for kids in that Fred Method way 
that's inspiring curiosity and creativity, that's providing the connection to the adults in their lives and to the peers in their lives. There are more than 600 schools, museums, libraries, early learning centers, campuses of higher education, creative industries, all working together across Southwestern Pennsylvania and Northern West Virginia. And critical to that work, among others, are teams like this, the Pittsburgh Pirates and the Steelers and the Penguins and a minor league team like the Altoona Curve, a soccer team like the Pittsburgh Graverhounds. Over these past 15 years, these sports foundations and others, because there are 600 involved, have been involved in really wonderful and discreet ways, sometimes supporting STEM and coding, sometimes helping us to celebrate the educators who are really pushing the envelope of what's possible. It's put an incredible spotlight on this region. And this is work that's now expanded across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And in fact, the work that Remake Learning has done over the past 15 years to build out a learning landscape, a learning ecosystem, has now been replicated in places across this country, like Southern Wisconsin and the West Coast of Florida, centered on Sarasota, to places abroad, like Christchurch, New Zealand, Doncaster, England, and the country of Uruguay. And it all began with asking some simple questions about how might we and bold ideas that yielded thousands of additional ideas on the part of thousands of individuals across 600 organizations consistently asking how might we apply the Fred method because we recognize that we work better when we work together as a community. How might we connect all that we're learning about learning itself with the academic, social, and emotional learning that our kids want, need, and deserve. So the question for you is how will you take Fred forward in some important and powerful ways in the opportunities that you have available to you in your own organizations and ideally together with your communities to build that atmosphere by which everything else works because learning and love are linked. And as Fred said to a journalist at the turn of the millennium, when a journalist turned to Fred and said, Fred, what's the biggest challenge facing humanity? And you might have, you, you could think of the things he might have said, turning to issues of war and peace or climate change or economic disparity. And he said this, try your best to make goodness attract attractive. That's one of the toughest assignments you'll ever be given. And so that's a charge that I leave for each of us to figure out the ways that we can make goodness attractive in our own communities. And so Michael, I've tried to take hours and hours of things that I could spend days thinking about and could give a thousand discrete examples and maybe there's an opportunity to share a very specific example, um, but that's, that's the work, that's the Fred method to build out these great learning landscapes that our kids need in every single community across this country. Awesome, Greg. Really, really appreciate that. Um, for everybody on the line, please um, feel free to add any comments, questions you have for Greg. I already see a few in here. Um, so while while people are writing new questions in, I'll, I'll give a, a start here. So, Greg, what do you think is the biggest challenge for sports team foundations when working with youth groups? And what are some uh, ways to over overcome these ob obstacles? <clears throat> Yeah, well, our sports foundations, well, first of all, they're so deeply respected, right? And kids have, they just have a, an emotional connection the way that we, you and I have a, maybe an emotional connection to Mr. Rogers. They have an emotional connection to the teams that they cheer for and the players on those teams. And so I think oftentimes the, the biggest challenge face, facing a sports foundation or any type of organization that, that's external to the core environment of the educational community is to navigate really the complexity and the small p politics of the educational landscape and understanding like, okay, how do I make sense of educational service agencies and this whole um, out of school time market and the mentoring organizations and the summer programs. And it's through intermediary organizations. For example, here in this community, there's the Allegheny Partnership for Out of School Time. There's a, an early learning organization called Trying Together. There's another organization called the Mentoring Partnership. It's these types of intermediaries that if sports foundations can connect to, they can in turn, for example, connect to 150 mentoring programs, but do, through, do it through that infrastructure of the mentoring partnership, again, in, in this community. So I think it's, it's finding, finding those two, three, five people 
who are then connected to that landscape the way that we have in this community with organizations like I just mentioned, and ideally with organizations like Remake Learning um, that help build out that atmosphere, that infrastructure. And if it's not there, sports foundations have a tremendous opportunity in leadership to find the right school leaders, to find the right out of school time leaders to help build that out. Excellent. All right, to the next question here, what are some of the most effective ways you can think of for multiple teams from the same city can work together to achieve a common goal of helping the youth within the community? Well, look, collaboration is hard, right? And, and in fact, we have a whole chapter about how Fred really helped um, kids to work together. And there really is no better way than, um, you know, to get in that room together and blue sky think together and say, look, we all have our self-interests right? But how are we going to put down our self-interest to find that collective interest? And that's what we've done, Michael, through Remake Learning. You know, oftentimes, you know, I mentioned this network of 600 schools, museums, libraries, and others, right? They all have their self-interests, right? They all have a particular framework, like some for STEM, some for maker-centered learning, others through art and design. And the question is, how can you, how can a group appeal to the self-interests that are properly constructed and, and good to lean into and yet find that common interest together? I think it's oftentimes through a neutral partner, right? Because I think it's hard for sports, in this case, sports foundations to come together and say like, okay, what would it mean to work together? But to come together as a group, together with a, 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 you know, a regional mentoring organization or a regional campaign for third grade reading effort, you know, to find that neutral partner who can then work with them so that they can find ways to connect their self-interests together with the collective interests in the community. And, an, and a neutral organization has probably done that due diligence, that reconnaissance to understand what is the, what is the need in the community and then figure out a way to like, this is how we're going to get the Penguins involved. This is how we're going to get the Steelers involved. This is how we're going to get the Pirates involved, something like that. Yeah, absolutely. And I know it can be tough you know, a lot of the times the, the seasons don't necessarily, you know, happen at the same time. There's always, you know, different busy times for, you know, the different leagues. Yeah. So, you know, we're well aware of the of the complexities here. But, you know, to your point, it kind of needs one voice to bring everybody into the room together to start having those conversations that can lead to larger change and Michael, know, that's in your city. And really, that's no different than, say, if we said, let's get all the after school time programs together, right? Like they yeah. have competitive interests. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but having a neutral partner with whom they can collectively work, because some of them are just summertime, some of them are year round, some of them are competing with geographies, right? Yeah. It's that neutral partner that can bring down the walls a little bit and everyone can breathe a little bit and just say, like, okay, I'm still going to meet the self interest of my board or my organization and yet contribute to this common goal. Absolutely. Um, another interesting one here. So sports teams can generally make goodness or kindness or giving back attractive. Yeah. So how do you have, do you have any sample programs for sports foundations that can spark the Fred method when they're, you know, attempting to, to do that in their community? Yeah. So we, um, I'll give you a very, um, current example. There's a, in this community, there's a kindness in action campaign underway. This is the third year of that campaign. And um, we've got 15 different schools. So first of all, it's a partnership involving the public television station, the Children's Museum, the Jewish Community Center, a youth serving organization called Be the Kind Kid. And they've all worked together to build out this campaign. And kids in across 15 different school districts are, are imagining projects that convey kindness in their communities. They're gonna then build them out. And then there's gonna be a showcase of those uh, of what the kids construct that conveys the importance and how to be kind, right? And so I think of a campaign like that and I think about sports foundations and there are a couple of different roles someone could play. There could, at that end, there could be, you know, I could imagine the Pittsburgh Pirates having a showcase in PNC Park, right? Like using the venue as a place to which the community can come to see those student-based projects. I think, for example, last year when the Pittsburgh River Hounds, the soccer team, they recorded all sorts of social media um, interviews with the players themselves that were then integrated into the social media campaign for this regional kindness campaign. 
So, um, yes, I mean, sports foundations in particular, they have venues, they have facilities, they have, you know, well-recognized and loved players. They have brands that sometimes if that brand of the Pittsburgh Steelers is on something, you know that like, well, that's exciting and that's probably high quality. And for some, like, that's going to be super cool. So thinking about ways that assets like that can come together in a campaign in that way, I think is really, um, it's just powerful. Absolutely agreed. Um, so I've got a question here. I'm talking about, you know, how you would collaborate with these different organizations, how you can relate that back to fundraising. Um, that is, you know, the primary goal of the of most people on this call. Um, and just kind of, you know, a description of how you would make that work. And again, some suggestions and how to incorporate this into that type of messaging, which is a little bit different than maybe what you're talking about at a base level. Yeah, well, um, well, let's start with the money first, because I try and talk plainly about money, right? Um, sports foundations clearly have a brand and a built-in audience, which is, you know, that's a powerful and, and valuable thing in and of itself. And then if it can be tied, if that can be tied together uh, with something that's so obviously beautifully happening in the community, like that kindness in action campaign, right? Or um, something like, um, you know, the sensibility, the name, the narrative of something like Fred Rogers that has an emotional tie. I mean, I imagine that there are Fred Rogers like characters in almost every city in the country. And it's something that Remake Learning has done really well and built, you know, leaning into that narrative. You know, it's not just about uh, advancing great learning and great educational experiences for our young people across the community and all the stories that go with that. But it, it builds into a local narrative about advancing Fred Rogers legacy and what Mr. Rogers need, means to that to this community. Um, I think tying the uh, fundraising into that narrative that has an emotional appeal, but also is deeply local and self-interested to that community is um, is important. And, and that is something that can certainly accelerate fundraising. We've seen that happen right here in this community because of that. And Michael, what was the first part of your question? I apologize. Uh, it was just about how um, you would collaborate with those organizations yourself in terms of, um, you know, bring the, the Fred method to them. You know, how do you typically go about um, working with different organizations? Okay, I heard that question in two different ways. So, um, so at the grave, so I, I wear a couple of different hats, right? Um, and um, through Remake Learning, we have published all sorts of articles and um, publications, videos of uh, of examples of people playing out the Fred method. Uh, and then it's also something my my co author and I, you know, we go. We're fortunate. Um, uh, this book is now in its seventh printing. And we've been traveling across the country. We'll be in Los Angeles next week. Um, we get a chance to go around the country to talk about, obviously we have a you know, much broader presentation about what is the Fred method? How is it tied to what we're learning today about learning? How does it connect emotionally? And then giving lots and lots of very discreet examples of teachers and um, you know, museum exhibit directors and librarians and others using the Fred method in their work. Uh, a very simple, simple example of that, Michael, right? We talk a lot about belonging and I use the example of, of connection, which is why I give this example. But, um, you know, change doesn't happen and innovation doesn't happen like out of, a, uh, out of a magic hat. Like there's a signal to us in the world and here's a signal in the world, red carpets, right? Law sports teams and, and, and others would know like the significance of a red carpet. Like, you know, that's an important moment. Well, teachers at a school just outside of Philadelphia literally started rolling out a red carpet for kids, not every day, because they, they had to make it special, but like literally rolling out a red carpet in the hallway. So as those kids are walking to the school, like they know what a red carpet is, right? Like that's a small little Fred bet, a little Fred method bet that just demonstrates to those kids I matter, I belong here, and this is a special place, and maybe I'm special walking the red carpet, right? Change happens not in, you know, in declarations of now we shall all do this, right? 
but rather in those thousands of little Fred-like bets like that red carpet signifies at a, a school just outside of Philadelphia. So um, I wish we had time. I mean, I would share just like thousands of examples, some of them, you know, a lot of which are in our book, but we've been curating more and more examples from around the country and we've been doing any number of events. Was that responsive to your question, Michael? It is, okay. it is. Um, so another question from the chat here, I mean, I know we're gonna wrap it up soon, but if, if we're interested in starting a remake learning in our market, how would we go about it? Okay, I love this question. So um, first of all, I'll, I'll acknowledge like it's hard, right? I mean, this is 15, now 16 years of work. If you go to remakelearning.org, you will see, um, and, and actually if you Google remake learning playbook, you'll find a playbook that was published in 2016. There are also some additional publications. There's one called the Pittsburgh Principles. Again, Google Remake Learning P Pittsburgh Principles. And you'll find some actual toolkits, like this is how we do this in our community. Now, having said that, one of the things that we've learned, because we get calls from like Fremont, California or Sarasota, Florida to say like, how do we do this? We wanna do this. Remake Learning Days is a springboard to building out the ecosystem. So Remake Learning Days is a festival that we started here in 2016. And in that first year, there were hundreds of events in local libraries showcasing their maker spaces or school showcasing its STEM lab or their mobile STEM lab or whatever it might be. And 25,000 families came out to that event in that first May back in 2016. Remake Learning Days as a, as a, as a, a family friendly festival of innovative learning practices has expanded now I think to 20 cities across America and as I mentioned, three international locations. And in fact, later this year, the World Innovation Summit on Education is publishing a, a piece about um, Remake Learning Days and how a festival can be a springboard to building out the ecosystem because it starts to bring people together to have the discrete activity of building out events, showcasing those events. And in fact, this is where the sports teams come in because for example, with the launch of Remake Learning uh, days uh, three years ago, we had this big event in the, um, you know, it was a non-baseball day at PNC Park where the Pirates play. And the mayor was there and the county executive there. And there were thousands of kids roaming <laughs> the concession areas because we had this like festival-like thing launching Remake Learning Days. And there were banners on the bridge right outside the ballpark. Weirdly enough, something like a festival, which can happen in a singular school or can happen across a community with hundreds of events, can be a springboard and a powerful one to building out the sort of relationships that then allow the 24-7, the 365 days a year uh, ecosystem to start to get built out. Amazing. Really appreciate that. Um, just to end things out, I'll ask one more question and, the, and then we'll get out. I know we want to stay around 45 minutes. Oh, I could stay forever, Michael. <laughs> I know you could. Uh, can you just tell us a quick um, specific example or story that you witnessed where a team really impacted a child or, or group of child's life through remake learning or, or the Fred method? Yeah. So let me take you to a place called California, Pennsylvania. California, Pennsylvania, there's a place called California, Pennsylvania. It's in the Southwestern corner, rural, not well resourced. This is a community that's started wrestling with, you know, what is it that we're gonna do to support our kids and increasingly personalize learning in some powerful ways. They've connected with Remake Learning to build out all sorts of partnerships in little California, Pennsylvania with Carnegie Mellon University, with the, the museum sectors and others. And they, again, made lots and lots of little bets, Michael. So through these partnerships as they're building them out, they started printing 3D violins. $50 a pop working with a fab studio to print violins so the kids could have strings, right? They ended up working with a a solar company and, 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 and got these solar powered um, vehicles to go from campus building to campus building in this rural setting. They, you know, there they are in, in a rural setting. They said like, what if we started working with some therapists in our region and brought in lambs and um, little pigs and things to read with the kids in a way that they feel comfortable. Um, th I could go on and on of like little examples that they started to build out in terms of partnerships, but then they integrate it into the curriculum. like as they're raising bees in the backyard, they're integrating that into the math class with algorithms, right? I mean, it starts to become this environment where um, kids are swept up into great learning. And 
you know, this is where our, our book title, Michael, comes from. Do you, did, did you know that you wonder when you're learning? Um, or do you know that you're learning when, you know, I can't even get my book title right. But the point being that the University of California essentially has a study from just 10 years ago that says if you can tap into kids' interests, you know, maybe it's that 3D violin, maybe it's solar power, maybe it's the lamb at the reading, they, it comes like a vortex and they start sweeping up everything around them, whether they're interested in it or not. Well, those, all those sort of little Fred method like bets are transforming this school district and this community such that they're starting to think in more systemic ways now that are Fred like, like how do we start to apply IEPs, not just for kids who would typically need that IP, but like, what if we did IEPs for every single kid? What if we had some amazing partnerships, you know, through technology enhanced education that we didn't have before with all of these assets in Pittsburgh, which is only like 70 miles away, but we didn't have before. So they're starting to realize some systemic changes because of some small Fred method things that they started doing and just adding and adding and adding on. Excellent. Well, really, really appreciate all of your time, Greg. This is fantastic. Um, as a thank you for everybody that's joined the call, we're going to be sending you a copy of Greg's book. Um, we'd like you to have the opportunity to, to go through this methodology in more detail. Um, and please keep in contact with me or your customer success rep. If you have any questions, we can relay them to Greg and, and start a conversation. So, you know, again, Greg, can't thank you enough for your time. Really excited for this speaker series. This first one was awesome. Um, we've got another one coming up in a few weeks that you all will hear about shortly. And I think you'll be really excited for those topics too. But, you know, Greg, thank you again so much for starting us off on such a great, uh, on such a great foot. And we really look forward to, to continuing these. And I'm sure the folks in the line are really excited to delve into your book a little bit more. Well, Michael, again, thank you to you, to Dave, to all of your colleagues. And I, those of you who attended, uh, I wish I could see you, right? Because I go back to where I started. Thank you for what I know you do every day not only for your organizations, um, but maybe importantly, more importantly for those kids, the, the parents, families, caregivers in their lives, for their educators in and out of school, you play enormously powerful and important roles. And I'm hopeful you can make goodness attractive, make it a beautiful day in your neighborhood every single day. Amazing. Thank you so much, Greg. Thanks everybody for joining. Take care and have a great day. Thank you everyone.